Mr. Crosby, thanks for uh, joining us for part two of the Crosby conversation here. Well, it's no, a pleasure. It's a uh, pleasure. In part one, we were talking about the uh, Newfoundland provincial politicians that you've met. I'd like to ask you about federal politicians you've encountered, but before that, let me ask you about some other people. Rick Mercer. Well, Rick Mercer, of course, is, uh, has done fantastically well with the, with the CBC, and uh, he's one of the most popular actors now uh, in radio and TV, uh, uh, particularly with his uh, TV program. Uh, I, I know him fairly well. He did he ever ask you to do something that you said no? Or did, was he well, always well, able to talk into this crazy he, stuff? Well, he came down to, to do an, an interview here uh, for the CBC when uh, I had gotten uh, elected to uh, somewhere in, it was in connection with Ottawa, my being elected to go to Ottawa. He came down to do an interview and, uh, and, and, and we had an interview outside this house here. It was a lovely sunny day and uh, I, I had a shotgun uh, and uh, so I thought, well, now we need to do something. If this is going to be an entertaining interview, we had to decide to, to do something. So I said to, uh, to your great star, uh, why, don't, why don't I use my shotgun here? And uh, we, we sort of act, uh, uh, you will ask me something, it'll anger me, and uh, I'll take up the shotgun and uh, brandish it at you. And, uh, you and oh and I had him and he uh, I he was to be he was to be I, I was to be tied in the chair and uh, and uh, he was to let me loose and then I would chase him out of the, out of the, the interview and Jesus this worked wonderfully well uh, I forgot what the question was something about Smallwood or something and so I pretended to be infuriated and told him that he he wasn't welcome here any longer and got free of my bonds and jumped for the shotgun and uh, he didn't know that I had a shell in the shotgun and so so, uh, he, so he was supposed to be running and I was chasing him out of our premises here and uh, so he started running now I made sure I didn't aim anywhere close to him thank God my eyes were working that day so he started to run up the lane out there and I took the shotgun and fired a shot you know over in that direction and it was, a, it was the most, one of the most funny interviews I've ever seen on TV. It was, it was a classic. It really worked well. <laughs> so that's the type he is, right? He's quick to adapt. And, like, and of course, he's been doing, uh, as you know, he's a very popular program every week now on the CBC. Mark Critch. Mark Critch is my favorite comedian. I really like Mark, Mark Critch. What I like about all comedians and actors, uh, and uh, Mark Critch in particular is he, he doesn't have a nasty disposition. He's, he can be funny and so on, but he never tries to make you look stupid or silly. He's, uh, he's not cruel in that sense, you know. Lots of uh, people in the acting profession are in, in that position. It can be quite nasty at times, but he's never nasty. He's got a great sense of humor, and he's the same type. You can suggest anything to him. And uh, he, he, uh, he's good fun, so uh, he's a favorite of mine. Who does the best Crosby imitation? Well, he, 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 doesn't, do a, he doesn't do a bad imitation of me. Uh, I'm not, I can't remember any other great Crosby impersonators because I'm probably too sensitive. <laughs> Mary Walsh. Well, this is a Newfoundland woman of outstanding talent. I mean, look, in the arts and culture area, here in Newfoundland, the talent is just, it's abnormal how many tremendous men and women actors we have. Uh, another great one that I, I, I like is, is uh, Falstaff, you know, he did the Falstaff out in, over in, a year ago, over at the new theater uh, where we had the celebrations. John, John Guy's comedy, you know, the first, um, you know who Cupid's. I'm? Cupid's. Cupid's, yeah. And he he did he did the he's done some great acting. He he's a fine actor. He's a fine writer. And so we and we've got the, the, and we have another the learned man that just did the book on Confederation. You know who I'm talking about. Great friend of Falstaff. 
a great actor and comedian and book writer. He just did the book on Confederation. Yeah, you know the, the, about the, the way we were Shanghai'd or pushing. Oh, uh, Greg Malone. Greg Malone. Don't tell the Newfoundlanders. That's right. Well, Greg Malone is another one of this group. Uh, they all came up together and Mary, and uh, their their uh, TV programs have been outstanding. And Mary is outstanding comedian herself and actress. Uh, so uh, we've done wonderfully wonderfully well here. And it, it, I, there isn't another place in Canada can match us for talent in writing, acting, comedy, drama, it doesn't matter. We're, it's full of it here in Newfoundland. Newfoundlanders are fine actors anyway. We're a very difficult people, uh, as you must realize. Uh, it's not easy to please Newfoundlanders, right? And it doesn't take them long to decide that you need a kiss, kick in the ass or you know, you're not doing your, what they want you to do or you're not getting enough for them. So they're, not di they're difficult to represent in many ways, but they're popular across Canada. I never worry about the name Newfie. To me, that's a term of affection. We're called Newfies across Canada because the people across Canada think that we are, you know, characters and worth noticing and, and uh, there are, we're hard workers. They see Newfoundlanders and Alberta and all across Canada working. And uh, all our men and many of our women have had to leave Newfoundland for a hundred years to go work elsewhere in the world to feed their families and keep their uh, homes going. And uh, so our reputation across Canada, I've traveled in all parts of Canada and uh, the reputation of Newfoundlanders everywhere is outstanding. You tell them you're a Newfoundlander, they're interested in you immediately and they'll talk with you. And uh, so this is great and Mary, is an, and Mary and all these people we've just discussed are, are part of that. We're, uh, you know, you go out to Alberta and uh, we're, we're well thought of out there. there uh, and so a new fee to me is a term of endearment and affection. Uh, I mean, it doesn't, some people don't like the term new fee. I say, I don't care what they call you as long as they look up to you and it's done in a, a good friendly sense, you know. What, what's the word Canuck? Well, Canadians are Canucks. Well, what a foolish word. I'd sooner be called a Newfie than a Canuck at any, t any time. Was, um, was having a cameo role in the Republic of Doyle one of the highlights of your term in office of Lieutenant Governor? Oh, yeah, well, that was good fun. You know, <laughs> that was good fun. Did you play a bookie or a bartender or? What was, or was it a gambling? Uh, well, uh, I think it was a gambling and, and bartending. Yeah. Yeah. So, something more something than likely out, bartending. Something not out of character. Yeah. One of the th things that, 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 we, that we did initiate at Government House was that the, the uh, gays and homosexual transvestites and so on, association, whatever that's called, wanted asked could they have a reception at Government House. Now in earlier years they had been refused, right, because it was thought by the incumbent then this is too tricky, right, the lesbians and homosexuals and transvestites being invited into Government House for a reception. So I said, no, sure, you're, you're welcome here. Yeah, I mean, uh, all, this is uh, not illegal. This is, society is accepting, is accepting this now, these changes and these uh, you, you know, sometimes you might feel a bit sorry about uh, some of the problems they're having, but the, there's no reason that they shouldn't be accepted at Government House, the same as anyone else who's straight or not uh, gay. So we had a marvelous reception, and it was great, a great success. And I was delighted to, to create a precedent down at Government House for these people, who are, they're, they're all the men and women just like you and I, and they've had, they have a different nature than you or I, but this is not illegal. So I said, certainly you want to have a reception here, we'll have one. So that's one of the things that I'm most proud of uh, uh, with respect to our term at Government House. Have you gotten used to making your own meals again and driving your own automobile? Or? Look, uh, the worst feature of no longer being Lieutenant Governor, because the Lieutenant Governor has a chauffeur. The five years of having a chauffeur was great, you know, you could get parked anywhere and get picked up and all the rest of it and uh, because you know how difficult it is in St. John's to get parked anywhere. So the, the most uh, thing that gives me the most uh, despair since I left Government House is I no longer have a chauffeur. Now I have to drive myself 
And uh, I have to say this, it's not moose we're in danger from on the roads. We're in danger from Newfoundland drivers. Newfoundland drivers are a hundred times more dangerous than Newfoundland moose. And, and the moose, at least you can put up flashing lights to warn them, although they don't seem to work. But the, the driving in Newfoundland is the danger. The, that arterial road that I had to take all the time is a menace. Speeding on it, no one observes the speed limit, and I'm trying to observe it. And if I'm going at 80 kilometers an hour, there's somebody three feet away from me who wants to pass right, and the next thing you know, they're going to be up your backside because you'll have to st stop quickly and they'll be right up your, your tail. It's a, the seri a very serious problem is the, the terrible conditions for driving and the huge increase in motor vehicle traffic in Newfoundland. That's what I notice most. I want to come back to something you, you said a bit ago about Newfoundlanders are quick to satirize and, uh, you, and, and we're, I'm asking about you know, a younger generation of satirists, Mark Critch and Murray Walsh, but what about Ray Guy? You would have known oh, Ray, Ray Guy when he was a young man. Oh, Ray, Ray Guy was a hero of mine. Uh, I, I, not only was he a tremendously gifted writer, but he, but he had guts. When Ray, <coughs> when Ray, <coughs> excuse me, when Ray, Ray Guy uh, was uh, doing his thing, keeping Joey on his toes and opposing his authoritarian, dictatorial ways, he was the only one doing it. Everyone else in Newfoundland was frightened of Gain and Joey's wrong side. And Ray Guy was doing this clever, this clever satire and, and uh, attacking all Joey's excesses. The young man from the outports, he, he was a superb writer. And I, I was delighted when our newspaper here in Portugal Coast, Phillips, uh, had Ray on in his retiring years and he was living out here. And, and um, he was an outstanding writer still, right to the very end when he's in his late 70s. So he has to be recognized for his courage. And, uh, very few people would have taken the risks he did. Uh, because if we had been an independent country, one of the things I often thought, if we had been an independent country, I don't know whether we would ever have been able to get Mr. Smallwood out of office. But because we were part of Canada, no, and no one province could, uh, could the authoritarian dictatorship take over, you know. I'd like to ask you about some of the politicians you've met who, who had guts. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of people ask you about Sheila Cops, and I'm not going to ask you about Sheila Cops, right. but I'm interested in your thoughts about Pat Carney. Pat and I fell out, and she was a, quite a difficult character, but a, a strong, a strong uh, feminist, I guess you could call her, and, and, it, and, and an able woman, but very unbending. She couldn't get on with people, very difficult to deal with, but she did. Uh, Mulroney, she was the energy critic in, uh, when Mulroney got the leadership of the PC party. It was about the next year that was likely to be an election, <coughs> and he was very clever, and he had everybody in the caucus because they knew he was going to be leading the party in the next election, and if they wanted to get promoted to cabinet or whatever, they had to satisfy Mulroney that he was in the he was in the uh, he, he had the power and it was going to be there in the next and then if you wanted to make progress and. PC politics, you had to satisfy Mulroney. And uh, at first, when the Newfoundland, when I was involved, and uh, we were had, still had a stalemate on the offshore resource question, and so I wanted to get Mulroney to confirm Joe Clark's position was that the province of Newfoundland should have exactly the same rights to revenues and so on offshore as did the federal government, or as did uh, or he went even further, as though the resources were on land in Newfoundland, not just a uh, hundred miles out to sea. Uh, Joe Clark had gone even further. So I naturally wanted that to continue as our policy. And uh, so Brian didn't accept that right away. He said he, you know, he wanted to think about it and uh, because of uh, how it would affect uh, 
our relationships with the rest of Canada and so on. So, he, but he set up. He had all the members of the caucus given an assignment, and uh, Pat Kearney, she was the energy critic. So he appointed her as a committee to negotiate with the then Newfoundland government to work out a deal uh, that would satisfy Newfoundland government and us, and we could accept so that when we got into office, we would carry that out as our policy. And so Pat did that, and she did it quite capably. And she used to deal with Bill Marshall, who was another, uh, Bill is another, uh, somewhat, he, can, he could be quite sticky himself, strong-minded. Uh, none of them are namby-pamby, all these people. Uh, and she did a good job there. But when we got into the free trade negotiations, she became very difficult. She couldn't get on with the, the, the person that Mulroney appointed, Simon yeah, Reisman, who was the one, the, the civil servant leading the negotiations. She didn't get on with him, and I was on that committee, etc. Uh, so she was, uh, she was uh, difficult in many ways, but uh, a hard-working woman and, and did good service for Canada and for Newfoundland, as far as that's concerned, but a very difficult person to be a colleague of and so on. Another, another woman with, that I always thought that had guts was Maureen McTeer. But clear up the clear up the mystery for me now, or for viewers. PC leadership convention, you're challenging Mulrooney. Joe Clark's delegation is defeated. If Joe Clark would have thrown his support to you, that might have changed the outcome. You would have been the prime minister. Brian Peckford goes to Joe Clark and Maureen McTeer. You've got to you've got to come. And what what did Maureen McTeer? Say yeah. the well, that, that, he, uh, Brian uh, was very supportive of me. We had uh, had our differences, but he he was a great supporter of mine in, in that leadership. And so he went up. He he left and crossed the floor, and uh, there's only a, you know a few minutes before the next ballot to uh, try to get to make Joe realize or get him to accept the fact that if he wanted to stop Mulroney, he only could do it. He wasn't going to be able to do it. But he, but I could, I could get enough votes from his supporters, and uh, disaffected supporters of other candidates to probably stop uh, Mulroney, mm -hmm. and, uh, and it was quite amazing. So uh, we could see Brian up there before, uh, before Joe and Maureen, waving his arms right and gesticulating and and putting this over, and she she, she looked at him and she said, "Look here." Brian, she said, go F yourself. Uh, you could hear it too in the stadium, across the stadium, you know, <laughs> she was telling him, what well, he had to F off. A very sensible, but she was, but, uh, she was a fine woman, uh, she, independent, uh, free speaking type, uh, equal rights for women, all, all admirable things. Uh, but uh, at, at, at earlier on, a few years earlier, this was all unpopular with a lot of men, and particularly right-wing men. Right-wing men did not exactly cotton to the, the feminist movement. And she, she was, and had made clear what her own position was. And uh, so I, I had to admire her for that. And she's, uh, and she's, and I, uh, I remember speaking for her uh, in, when she ran herself in the district there up near in Ottawa. And, uh, she was suspicious of me at first because she thought I was, I was not a real ardent feminist, you know, that I was a, um, a bit of a barbarian or whatever, ignoramus. Uh, but if we started to get on after, after that, and I admired her for her, her courage, and she's, uh, she's still doing well, and she's, uh, she and Joe both have done well in, with the teaching at universities and so on. But uh, she was an, an early woman uh, the feminist movement, and when the, when the feminist movement was not popular now today, everybody runs around, they're damn careful what they say about women. Uh, of course, I've always been that way. In part one of our conversation, you told, you, you mentioned how the, the high regard you held Brian Mulrooney in. Mm -hmm. right. What were your thoughts when, in the course of the Airbus investigation, 
it emerged that he accepted cash in an envelope from a German industrialist in a hotel room. Well, I had been very supportive of, of uh, Brian, naturally, and I had been Minister of Transport when all these stories were going around about uh, the Air Canada was, had to get aircraft and, uh, and that it was in the hands of uh, Brian Mulroney or Frank Moores, the lobbyist, uh, who, uh, whose firm were supporting uh, this, uh, the, the other uh, the other party, uh, the Airbus uh, crowd, uh, to, to get the contract from Air Canada. And, uh, you know, the rumors were that Frank Morris had fantastic influence and he controlled the board of directors of Air Canada. They're all completely false malarkey. And he certainly didn't control me. I wasn't going to be approached by anyone uh, in favor of, of either. This was the business of the board of directors of Air Canada, an independent crown corporation. And so I had the, the, the vice president, he later became president, the French-Canadian gentleman, uh, in when all these rumors got going around. And ch I checked with him and I said, look, I want to know if the prime minister or anyone from the prime minister's office has ever approached anybody uh, in the PMO or the prime minister to, uh, to looking for uh, to try to convince them to give this contract to Airbus rather than, than uh, Air Canada, or not Air, Airbus, rather than the, the American firm Boeing. And uh, he assured me that all the directors' committees of Air Canada, who all these decisions are referred to, had all approved the, the submission by Airbus has been the better one than the Boeing one. Now the Boeing lobbyists in Ottawa had spread all these rumors, you know, that the Airbus appeared to be favored because Frank Moore's the lobbyist in bed with Mulroney had such fantastic influence that uh, Frank Moore's could determine who got the contract. This was all malarkey. I was the minister. I knew nobody had approached me and I know what would have happened if they had. And they knew what would happen if they had, because I was known to be independent. And Frank knew there was no good coming to me about it. And so it was all completely false. And, uh, and I stuck with him and I was going to testify for him. And uh, you remember at the last minute, uh, the, um, that got the, the government finally settled the, the thing. Now later on, as you say, the, later on the startling news came that uh, Brian had seen uh, seeing the German who was behind Carl all the lobby, yeah. Schreiber, Schreiber uh, that Brian had met him and, uh, and it had accepted something from him. Uh, so, uh, well, I, uh, I was quite surprised and startled by this, but I think that at that time, uh, Brian had decided and announced that he was resigning. And I, I think that he was worried and concerned about his future as an ex-prime minister. You know, he, he and his wife were used to a good living, good income, and how he was going to do. And I blame a lot of this on some of his staff who should have known better and should have protected him and should have told him, no, we're not going to arrange for you to see this man Schreiber. He's a man to see the danger. You can't do it and we won't allow you, and we won't help arrange it. Instead of that, they did arrange it. And then it turned out that one of them was a lobbyist for, had already agreed to be a lobbyist for the German. So that's what I blame it on, and I, I, and I think that Brian succumbed to nervousness as to how he was going to be doing after he, he left the prime ministership. Other than that, I don't know anything about it, but it was a, it was a bad mistake. Yeah, you know, it's a shame. After delivering the Atlantic Accord, which has made such a difference for this place, right. and uh, to, uh, to uh, I, I don't have a character. It was more than a stumble, it was a real mistake. Yeah, well, it's a sounding fact that he's been a great success, right? He's in demand all around the world to be on boards of uh, corporate directors, recognized as having a lot of influence here in Canada, and uh, powerful friends in Quebec in particular, but everywhere, he's, he's liked everywhere. And uh, so he's, he's doing well, and I'm glad that he is because he did, he did well by Newfoundland 
and uh, I'll always be a friend and supporter of them. Let me ask you just a, a last question uh, about another politician with guts, Danny Williams. Well, Danny, of course, is a very able businessman and person and, and a, a great personality, a hard worker and all of these things. I thought he, I thought he was a bit, I thought he tended to be too autocratic and, uh, and, uh, and sort of overbearing in that sense. So what uh, I think really saved Danny was his astonishing decision to retire. Uh, he, he could have run again right, and been the premier for another four or eight or ten years. But instead of that, after two terms, or he was approaching his second term, he decided to do what he had promised himself earlier he would do, to, to resign and turn it over to someone else. Well, so that's very unusual for a politician, and I give him great credit for doing that. And he's certainly very able, and still very popular in Newfoundland. It's quite amazing. You know, once you're out of politics, you, your popularity or whatever uh, doesn't last all that long. Uh, but he's still well known and respected in Newfoundland, so that's, uh, I'm not going to say anything that would uh, disturb the even tenor of my ways with Danny. You're in your 80s and you're still well regarded and well, popular I, man. Uh, well, uh, that's nicely. You've had a great run. Uh, yeah, uh, nicely you'd say that, yes. Uh, I, I got a little quotation here because I knew you were going to bring up. Just, just give me a minute. Uh, take your time, we'll end on this. It'll okay. be grand. Uh, here, here's, what, here's what I believe, and I, I want to quote Tennyson. I like to quote Tennyson when I'm thinking about my age now and uh, I'm retired and I don't like being retired and so on. Here's what Tennyson's advice was. He said, how dull it is to pause, to make an end, to rust unburnished, not to shine in use. Some work of noble note may yet be done. And that's the way I feel. I don't know what the work of noble note may be. <laughs> Maybe me writing notes to myself. <laughs> Mr. Crosby, thanks so much for your time. I yeah. appreciate you indulging us and doing, you know, Great. Crosby Conversations 1 and 2. It's been really a pleasure to see yeah. you again. Thanks well, so much. It's nice to see you again.